Welcome to another edition of Dan Factoids. In this edition we'll be discussing the issue of tympanostomy tubes or grommets that are sometimes placed in the tympanic membrane and their implications on diving. Keep watching. Here's a question we received from a diver recently which is quite a typical question but the details were so relevant that we felt that we wanted to share it in its entirety. The diver said I've occasionally had problems clearing my ears particularly my one ear, the right ear and I have tried different medications for allergies, for nasal congestion and a couple of months ago I had a sinus infection after which I saw a doctor and then an ENT surgeon and I had muffled hearing. In addition there was fluid behind my eardrums I was prescribed a course of oral steroids and antibiotics and then after going back to the ENT they found that there was still fluid behind the drum that my eardrums weren't moving normally and they decided to place tympanostomy tubes or grommets. What are the chances of me continuing diving and will I harm my ears by continuing to do so? Well that's quite a mouthful and I'll try and address that in broad strokes to give you the principles behind the question of what you've described so vividly. So first of all thank you for your question. Middle ear equalizing problems are the single most common cause of diving problems we encounter. Middle ear barotrauma specifically is the most common diving condition. Under the normal ranges of barometric pressure, in other words in our usual day-to-day -day living, we're actually not even aware of our need to equalize our middle ear. It's an unconscious event and it happens spontaneously as we yawn or swallow. But when we dive we have to pay more attention and often have to equalize deliberately to allow the atmospheric pressure to be equalized as it increases underwater and our eardrum starts to bulge inwards. Now if there's a structural abnormality or congestion this mechanism may fail and a partial vacuum may form even at the surface and when this happens the partial vacuum or the pressure differential draws fluid or even blood into the middle ear which can then sometimes become infected and result in the need for antibiotics. It doesn't only affect the middle ear it may also affect the sinuses because the lining of the sinuses and the eustachian tube are actually the same. It's called respiratory epithelium and it's unique in that it has little hairs that beat the mucus that is formed by the cells in the direction of the various openings. The openings of the sinuses into the nasal cavity and of course the openings of the eustachian tube in the back of the throat. Now there are four conservative and three invasive options that are applied to address the underlying problem. Oh and by the way avoiding dairy products for 48 hours and smoking cessation are perhaps two of the best options that you can apply and will actually save you money as well as making equalizing easier. But when it comes to actually doing something medical about it, the conservative options include firstly reducing the tendency for inflammation or nasal mucosa congestion and with that the eustachian tube by a single seasonal intramuscular injection of hydrocortisone. In other words once every three months or once 
in the season of allergies, which is in the change of seasons, people get a single injection of cortisone and that actually ramps down the tendency to allergies and many people get dramatic relief uh, through this procedure. The second is the daily topical of application of cortisone spray which again reduces the population of so-called eosinophils which are the white cells in our nasal passages that tend to provoke the inflammation and allergy and produce allergic rhinitis and sinusitis. The third option is taking non-sedating antihistamine tablets and we emphasize the use of non-sedating antihistamines because you don't want to be half asleep and then have the compounding effects of nitrogen narcosis on top of that. Lastly, there is the option of five to seven days of topical or oral decongestants usually taken before diving and not generally in conjunction with diving and as we mentioned these can be taken in the form of a spray which is slightly less effective or a tablet and these then assist in opening the various tubes both the sinuses and of course the eustachian tube. Now if these conservative measures don't work there's the option of doing surgery or trying to write the anatomy and one of the ways and these procedures are usually done under anesthetic is straightening the bone that divides the nose into two nasal passages and in a number of individuals may be deviated. The flow through the nasal passage as a result of this deviation can sometimes irritate one of the eustachian tube openings and make it more difficult to equalize. A second option is using a special tube and camera called an endoscope to try and open the eustachian tube and assist in equalizing the middle ear in that way and also sometimes the sinuses with basically the same intention. And lastly, there may be the option of making a hole in the eardrum and placing a tube, either called a PE tube or a grommet, which essentially is a short circuit. In other words, instead of air going through the eustachian tube to the middle ear, it goes straight through the tympanic membrane. Now that is great in terms of equalizing the pressure from atmospheric to the middle ear. The problem is you can't dive when one has loss of integrity of the tympanic membrane. In other words, when there's a hole. The grommet can assist in draining fluids, draining blood, and also sometimes allow the application of additional medication, which may allow the condition to subside more quickly. So of these various options, oral decongestants and tubes are not compatible with diving. However, the tubes usually fall out after about six weeks unless there are specifically long-term tubes that are placed that can stay in as long as two years. And the bottom line being, once those tubes have fallen out, and if equalizing is then again possible, you would be able to dive. And this is something that a diving doctor or preferably the ENT surgeon that placed the grommets would be able to evaluate. And with that, you might be able to enter the water. Now there are a lot of more resources on ears and diving that you may want to look at which include rinsing the nasal passages with saline and using a device called an otovent that exercises the eustachian tubes and many divers have great benefit 
from using these devices. So please check those things out uh, because they may be of great benefit to you. Well, with that, thank you for watching this edition of Dan Factoids. We hope we've answered the questions that you had and maybe some that you hadn't thought of. And thank you for supporting Dan and for giving us the opportunity to answer these very, very relevant questions.